Wow, look at all the space now the kids have gone. <laughs> all right, we do appreciate Pastor Dave and coming and speaking to us this morning. We do uh, joke around a lot of, about Pastor Dave. Usually I think he's good for two or three messages, but he really outdid himself today. I've got preaching material for probably three months, so. <laughs> but thank y'all. It's good to have y'all here, of course. All right, we're going to continue our study in the book of Philippians, so let's turn to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And we're going to take the first 14 verses. Philippians chapter 3. And I forgot my stylus, so. All right, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you to me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in, in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh he have whereof he might, uh, whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the tribe of the, the tri, I'm sorry, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I'd already attained, Either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto the things which are before. I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for another wonderful day of grace. We're thankful that we can come uh, by our own choice and our own free will and to spend time fellowshipping with one another and with you around the truth of your word. We pray today as we study that we'll let the Holy Spirit teach us. We'll let the, the words which we are reading out of your word impact our lives in, in just a positive way. And we'll give you the praise and glory for that. And it's in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and for his sake we pray. Amen. Well, you know, anytime you hear a preacher say, finally, it, it usually doesn't mean much. It just means <laughs> I'm stalling because I don't know where I'm going next, or just like and in closing. But, you know, he goes two more chapters after this, so we're aware of that. But what Paul is really getting to, you know, finally I'm going to be able to get to the crux of what I've been teaching you in the first two chapters. So he says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. And we can, we can say, well, what in the world is Paul saying to write the same things uh, to you, to me, indeed, is not grievous? What things are, is he talking about? You know, Paul spent a lot of time uh, in Philippi. And as he was in Philippi, the greatest, the greatest battles that they were fighting were coming from the outside with the Judaizers, with, uh, with those that were standing and opposing what the Apostle Paul was teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ today. 
And so they're there, so he says to write the same things to you, and this, this I believe, are the same things. Verse 2, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. The warnings are still the same. The attacks are still going on. There are still those that are coming and trying to uh, thwart the doctrines of grace and the dispensation of grace. You know, I looked up a guy, and one of the guys that I like to, uh, to check in to see what it is, because he guy's got, a, I think, a great sense of humor, uh, is a guy named Philip Doddridge. He was, a, he was from, the, uh, from England and lived in the early to mid, I think, 1700s. But listen to what he said about verse 2. He says, clearly, and this is clearly uh, paraphrasing Paul, he says, And in further prosecution of my great design for your spiritual security and edification, let me urge you to beware of those invidious, malignant, contentious persons whom I cannot forbear calling dogs. So much have they uh, a brutal and canine disposition, snarling and malicious, greedy and fierce. I'm thinking, man, why don't you just tell us what you really think? You know, he, he was reading, <laughs> he's reading this, he says, you know, Paul's got a good point here, but I don't think that he took it far enough. Let me just really tell you what, uh, what it is. And so he goes, he goes right after him. I think it's pretty good. So he says in, uh, in verse 2, he says, Beware of evil workers. Be, uh, beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. When he talks about the concision, he says, For such I must call the body of men which proudly usurp the name of the circumcision, whereas the external right uh, so much uh, contend for, but is unprofitable, cutting and ma uh, mangling of the flesh when performed by such principles and imposed with such a temper, so that the blood work, this is it, the blood work it may seem as an emblem of the cruel manners in which they cut and mangle the church. Because these people were talking and, you know, they say, let's let the issue of circumcision continue on and they were pressing and they were bringing great hardship to the church which was at, at Philippi then we get into verse 3 verse 3 says for we, uh, verse 2 and 3 beware of dogs beware of evil workers beware of the concision for we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. When he says, for we are the circumcision, you know, from time to time we possibly make a mistake and, and actually say something we probably don't believe. I've said it and I try to catch myself. It's so easy to say, guess what? We don't believe in circumcision today. And we don't believe in baptism today. We well, you know what? That's just not true. We don't believe in physical circumcision or the need for physical circumcision or the need for physical water baptism. And, uh, and that, because we do, come to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. Colossians 2. It says, And ye are complete in him. You know, we're, we're great question people around here, and I think questions are very, very healthy, very, very necessary. And ye are complete in him. And a great question is, how complete are we? And we're so complete. It says, verse uh, 11, In whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. We're so complete, we don't need circumcision. We don't need baptism. And here's an also a very big one. We no longer need any additional forgiveness of sins. In verse 13, And you being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses no amens no hallelujahs no praise the lord just taking it for granted are you no isn't that fantastic though 
forgiven of all trespasses. Come back to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 and verses 3 and 4, 3 through 6. For we are the circumcision which worship God and the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So you understand, we're the circumcision. We're the ones that were spiritually circumcised, spiritually identified with the Lord Jesus Christ, and we don't have any confidence in the flesh. Now, Paul had, some, had a, a great history. Paul had a lot going on uh, in his life before he met the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. But the point is, we don't have any confidence in the flesh. Paul really begins in, in a perhaps over a little bit of time, he began to understand that all the things that he got through his flesh, they had no value to him and no confidence in the flesh. He says in verse 4, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath where, uh, whereof he might, might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Now that's a tough one even for us to think about, that Paul could say that he was blameless. But you know how you were blameless according to the law? Every time the law said you did something wrong, you just went and you made the appropriate sacrifice. And so now the law says you're, you're not guilty until you do it again. Well, I like our plan today better. We're just not guilty. He says in verse 7, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. You know, there, there is that point in time in our life. This is not about the issue of sancti uh, justification. These are about the issues of sanctification. And we can hold on to these things, but there's going to be something that, that it's going to ultimately have a negative effect on and what that uh, is, it's going to have a negative effect ultimately on the type of relationship, daily relationship, that we have with the, with the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says in verse 7, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do, doubt, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Paul says, on this side, he says, on this side I got all my stuff. On this side I have the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, I, I count them but dung. He said, the, the, the thing is, I want to, it is to, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Unfortunately today, there are way too many people that the only Lord Jesus Christ that they know is Jesus Christ according to his earthly ministry. And that's great. We know who he is. That's a wonderful thing. That's a great foundation even for us. But the truth is, You'll never know the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ the way that Paul wants to know him if we don't recognize what it means to preach Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. He said, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. And I love that phrase. But what we want to also recognize, you cannot know Christ Jesus as your Lord until you first know him as your Savior. People get the cart before the horse sometimes. And so we think about that. He says, Christ Jesus, my Lord. And if you have trusted Christ as, you trusted that Christ went to Calvary, died on the cross for your sins, and you believe that he did it for you, guess what? Now he is your Savior. And become your Lord is another process. One is justification, one is the issue of sanctification. So Christ Jesus, my Lord, 
for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. The goal in Paul's life was to have this special relationship with him. He says in verse 9, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Four times in Paul's writings he talks about the faith of Christ. He does it here, of course, in Galatians and Romans. But he says, but, but that which is through the faith of Christ. You would think if, if Paul was trying to say these were things he was going to do and he's going to work his He's going to work his life. He was going to commit his life to service and ministry and his ability. But he says, what I learned under the law, I learned that my righteousness was absolutely nothing. That my righteousness was vile, it was wicked, it was corrupted, and nothing that God wanted. Today, in the dispensation of grace, once... You trust Christ as your Savior. And God the Holy Spirit baptizes you into the body of Christ. We have a relationship with Him where we tap into His life. We tap into His values. And we sit back and we can say, you know, our relationship to God today is not based on me, but it's based on the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness of, which, of God, which is by faith. And this is something that's part of the gift that God gives us. We know that eternal life is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But, you know, justification is just only a part of that. There's so much and so many things that, that God included. <coughs> when we trusted Christ as our Savior. Something makes up all the spiritual blessings we have in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And this type of relationship that Paul is talking about is, is part of that. But, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And Paul says, listen, I say this so I can express this that I may know him. You know, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his, unto his death. As Paul comes along, he says, I, you know, Christ is my goal. Christ is what I live for. And he's every bit a part of the Lord Jesus Christ as he's ever going to be positionally. But Paul's got some real desires that he wants to to express where he gets to see this as a reality in his life. I've said this before, and I I think I I really do believe that part of the problem that we have in the Mid-Acts Dispensation of Grace movement, we don't have an emotional connection to the Lord Jesus Christ. We just sit back and we have it and we, perhaps we take it for granted or whatever. But we don't have that emotional connection to the Lord Jesus Christ like Paul's talking about here. How many times have you made a decision when you thought in the back of your mind, will this further the fact that I really know the Lord Jesus Christ? And I can be identified with his death, with his burial, and his resurrection. Can I look at these things, and can I see what, uh, how the choices that I make in life can have a definite effect on the quality of my relationship with his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, with God's son, the Lord Jesus Christ? And do you know what it takes to make the system of grace so effective? You know, what makes, the, what makes the system of grace so much better for us today than the law? It's the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Come with me to Galatians, because Paul's going to talk, talk about the law, talk about some of the things 
we could expect. Galatians chapter 3 and verses 10 through 13. For all those people who think that they can change God's opinion of them, one iota by keeping the law is, uh, this is, this is where they, they miss the point. Verse 10 through 13, For as many as are the, of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. All things. That's a proud person who believes they can keep every single law, every single day, every single thought. But he goes on, verse 11, but that no man is justified in, uh, by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. The just shall live by faith. And the law is not a faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ, think of all he endured. Sitting there the, the night that he was crucified, had to endure the mocking, the beatings, the plucking of his beard, to be given gall to drink when he was thirsty, the crown of thorns that were jammed upon his head. And depending on what church you go to, some people think that that was required for Christ to pay the price of sin. And how many sins were paid for when they were abusing, physically abusing the Lord Jesus Christ? Not one. But what paid for all sin was the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. You know, perhaps the hardest thing that Christ had to endure that night was when God, his Father, made him to be sin for us. You know, to be in a relationship that Christ had with his Father was beyond amazing. Did you ever disappoint your father? Did you ever do something wrong, violate his rules? You know what? The Lord Jesus Christ never did. They had a perfect father-son relationship. And just as hard as it was for the Lord Jesus Christ to have to endure being made sin, what do you think it meant to God the Father to do that to his son? Well, he was made a curse for us so that he could redeem us so that the payments could be made and do you know what makes the system of grace then so effective grace works because of the involvement of the Lord Jesus Christ grace works because of who he is not because of who we are we don't make the system of grace work we work within that system, and we can identify with the person that makes it work. The bottom line is the whole system of grace continues, to, continues working and staying together because of Christ and his faithfulness. Come back, if you will, to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Verses 8 and 9. Paul says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. How do you view knowing the Lord Jesus Christ? The excellency of the knowledge. You know, so it's a specific knowledge today that... that we have access to but it is excellency of the knowledge there is no greater knowledge today no better knowledge today the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him 
not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Righteousness, when we trusted Christ as our Savior, we became absolutely righteous. Even when our life doesn't look like we're living righteously, are we righteous? That's because who we are in Christ Jesus is the standard. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship in Christ Jesus, unto good works. We are his workmanship. And he's not talking about the physical plant and the physical body that we have. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. We have to separate in our mind, in our thinking, in our motivation for how we go about to, to serve the Lord. We have to separate our fleshly mind from the spiritual mind that we have. And it's the new creature that's never failed, that is righteous, will always be righteous, can't be anything but righteous, Either that or there's a flaw in the system, and we know there's not. That which is of God, the righteous which is of God by faith, for this purpose, that I may know him. I can't come to this passage of Scripture without being really, really challenged about my attitude, about what I really think of my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is more than just a fact. It is something that empowers us as believers today. And the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death Every year around when we celebrate, think about, remember the crucifixion, there's always somebody who wants to be hung on a cross. And you think, what in the world are they thinking? We shouldn't be thinking about that person on the cross. That person can't do anything for us. He wants to get up and like he's being crucified. You know, they've never crucified one of those people. He can't tell you what it's like. They've not driven any nails into his head. They've not crowned him with a, a crown of thorns. They didn't drive any nails through his feet. They didn't pierce his side with a sword. They just put on a show. Paul says, I, I want to go beyond just even understanding what... I want to understand. I want to be able to experience, if you will that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. Fascinating passage of Scripture. What do you think about when you read this? Now, Stacy's here today, and Ben and Wanda, they're here today, and all the grandkids. You know who I heard preach this message probably 15 years ago? preached a message out of Philippians chapter 3, and it changed my life. And that was Alex. I tell you, when he went through with that, I just about was doing a Brother Hal crying because of what he had to say and how he said it and the impact. I knew that, that there was so much room for growth in my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I knew that we had to, that I had to do something, but, you know, I'm caught in the middle, and how do I do something without me doing it? The righteousness of God, which is by faith. It's a faith question. It's a faith issue. We can't do anything. You know you can't purpose on a daily basis to do this because... It's going to be difficult to keep the flesh out of it. The best thing to do is just recognize who we are and live in light of that. And then it becomes natural. You know, it is just the most natural thing for the new man 
to walk in Christ, to, to have his life, be exemplary, if you will, of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Paul's talking about that I, verse 10, that I may know him. And, you know, we know positionally he did. But Paul wanted to know him right now. Right now in the, in the spot and the circumstances that he was. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. You know, Paul had already written Romans chapter 6 by now. And so we understand that Paul knew about his identification with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Paul wanted to experience it in a real way. So it comes that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. And he says this, verse 11. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now, if you don't have a grasp, perhaps, of what Paul's context is about, you might would think, is Paul not sure he's saved? If I might attain, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. You know, we know Paul's not questioning his justification. But Paul says, I want, to, I want to attain the resurrection of the dead in my life right now. He says, if by any means this, could, this truth could be a reality in my life today, tomorrow, every day. Verse 12, he says, Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Do you know why Christ came and did what he did for us? When he did, he apprehended us. He, his blood his, and uh, his life overtook us, and we just trust Christ as our Savior. Not as though I'd already attained. He says, listen, I know my life is full of failure. Not as though I'd already attained unto the resurrection of the dead. Paul says, not saying, I've got my glorified body or I expect to get my glorified body uh, until the time's right. But he says, there's something I want to do with my body as it relates to the Lord Jesus Christ. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. And what does perfect mean? Of course it means perfect, but it also means complete. And was Paul complete? Yeah, he's not going to get any better than what he is positionally, but this is all about practical. But I follow after, I pursue I've got my goal in mind, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. You know, Paul says, I know I haven't arrived, but here's my goal. What did Christ apprehend us for? The number of believers that live in failure, who are overwhelmed by guilt, who just are just, uh, they're distraught over their inability to live the Christian life. And what are they thinking? I got to do it. I've got to do it. But Paul says, no, turn it around to be apprehended that for which I also am apprehended of Christ. Christ is the issue. He says in verse 13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Do you think there's any real way that you can forget some of the things that you've done? So Paul just saying, just kind of wipe it out of your mind. Don't remember it anymore. 
Yes, God did make us to be forgetters. I mean, I'm getting real good at forgetting, but that's because we live in a sin-cursed world. But those events in our life that we failed miserably on, that we failed and have failed over and over again. He says, forgetting those things which are behind. We come to the place and point in our life where we no longer bring them up and live in our failure once again. That we don't bring them up to cause us to feel guilty or inadequate. He says, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. The things which go on before us. The things which we go. We're going to replace all that negative thought with good, positive thought. Not about how good we are, but about how good the Lord Jesus Christ is. So he says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says that I may win Christ. He says my goal, my, if I have an ambition, it is to let the life of Christ live in me. And he says the prize of the high calling of God. Well, if God thinks this is a high calling... Perhaps we should as well. Which means we have to put some thought into the choices that we make and the decisions that we make. I mean, when Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. The question is, what are we going to do with our bodies? And Paul is saying here, with my body, I'm going to press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So in verse 15, he says, Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. Now he says, not as we're already perfect, but now he says we are perfect. So how do we reconcile that? He's talking about positionally, we are perfect. No, don't be thinking about what you thought about yesterday, or the arguments that we may have had, or the bad decisions that we have made, forgetting those things which are behind. Replace that thinking with reaching forth unto the prize. Reaching forth for that special enduring, unchanging relationship that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ. So let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if anything be, ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. So perhaps you're saying, well, I must be doing all right. God's not audibly whispered in my ear. And said, so, you know, you're not doing this right. Will God ever verbally correct you? It's okay if you said no. Because he will not. How is he going to correct us? He corrects us through his word. Specifically through his word rightly divided. He says in verse 16, Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained... Let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. You know, we're not perfect in our walk. But if you are purposing in your mind to allow the Word to dwell in you richly, to allow the Word to be that life-giving force that we live by, we have attained some things. Paul doesn't want us to let those go. He says, but let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. This was a message to the church at Philippi. That would be great if one or two of the local church family could purpose in their heart this is the way they wanted to live. 
But what if the whole church family purposed, I mean, made the decision to let the life of the Lord Jesus Christ live in them? So let us walk by the same rule that we're going to forget those things which are behind, and let us mind the same thing of reaching forth, going after and winning the Lord Jesus Christ, he says in verse 17, though, Brethren, be followers together of me. Mark them which walk so as ye have us for an ensample. Now he's going to go on to explain this in verses 18 and, and 19. He says, For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, who mind earthly things. So who's he talking about? Look back up at verse 2. He's not just going to leave it here for us to, so I, I think he's talking about you, <laughs> not talking about me. He's talking about those who were attacking the church at Philippi. He says, it's not grievous for me to remind you and to tell you the same things I've, I've been telling you since I was there. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. You be mindful of who they are, what they stand for, and you mark them. So not only you'll know who they are, but the rest will also know. So we come back down in the verse 17, brethren, be ye followers together of me. Why? Because Paul's going to lead us away from the dogs, from the evil workers, from the concision. He's going to lead us away from there. He's going to tell us where our true identity is. He's going to tell us where the life source of the life we're going to live is. And this is kind of discouraging, but we know it's true. He says in verse 18, for many walk. I mean, there's a lot of them. We have them all around us today. Different denominations, different groups. Now, Paul's going to say something I would never want to point my finger at and, and, and lay claim that I knew your motivation. But Paul wrote under the inspiration. He says, for many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping, they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Why? Because their message was about the ability to please God in the flesh. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Now, when you see the word for, we know we're going to continue with what we've been having. Here's some good news. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. When Christ comes back for the church, the body of Christ, where's he going to come from? He's going to come from heaven. He's going to come from heaven. He's going to catch us away and will we'll, uh, forever be with the Lord in the air. For our conversation is in heaven. Our conversation, our life, our manner of life is, a, is in heaven. Now, I've got a physical address that doesn't have heaven in the, in the address. I still live here. Paul wants us to redirect our thinking. Yeah, we're here, but we're truly a part, we're truly a citizen of heaven. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Come to Titus, chap Titus chapter 1. I mean, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. talking about the testimony that they had at the church of Thessalonica. He says in verse 8, 
For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. His son's in heaven and he's coming back. But you know what he's already done? Already delivered us from the wrath to come. Come back to Philippians chapter 3. And verse 20 says, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence we also look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now here's a verse that should just put joy in your heart. Because when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back from heaven, there's going to be a transformation of unparalleled magnitude who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Now, what do you think about your body? You ever think about how vile it is? All right, you two. Am I going to have to separate y'all? <laughs> Our vile bodies. You know, you know we, we fluff them up, we give them a bath every once in a while, and put some deodorant and some smell pretty on. And God says, you can't do enough. That is a vile, wretched body. Because the body that he's talking about is the flesh. And we can't do anything about that, and, and, but there's going to be a time. I got a list, and you know, Paul says it's not wise to compare ourselves among ourselves, but I got a list of things wrong with me. Then he's got some things wrong with him. I don't know anybody who really doesn't have at least something wrong with them. And in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, Things are going to change, and we will no longer have vile bodies. We'll have bodies that look and represent the life of the risen and glorified Lord Jesus Christ. So as Paul comes down through this passage of Scripture, some of the best advice we can always give ourselves and to give others and that is, in the dispensation of grace, we need to follow Paul. Now, some people take offense at that. They don't take offense when people say you need to follow Moses. But it just seems to be offensive today in the dispensation of grace that you say we need to follow Paul. But the only reason why we even bring it up is because Paul does. And Paul only brings it up because the Holy Spirit said, let's, let's communi communicate this truth here. It's important <laughs> that we make the choice to follow Paul. Brethren, be ye followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us, for an example. He says, mark the ones that are walking in light of the doctrines they're learning from us or from me. He says, and the reason why we want to mark those who are following Paul is because there are many, for many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. And who's he going after? He's not going after the tavern owner. He's not going after people who are obviously openly living in sin. He's going after the dogs and the evil workers and the concision, those who under the guise and the name of religion 
are confusing and drawing disciples away unto themselves. And Paul says, we'll not have any of that. You mark us so that they'll stand out like a beacon. And you know who they are and you know not to follow them. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come. One of the greatest things that we can do is live our life in light of the day. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back for us. Maybe today my Lord will come for thee. Maybe today his beauty I shall see. And what a blessing. Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his. No more flesh. No more tendency to sin that we can live from that moment on every single moment throughout eternity would be lived in victory, absolute victory. Fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Well, we praise the Lord for that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for, as we've been studying through the book of Philippians in chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3 now, all with such a great emphasis of learning and really knowing the Lord Jesus Christ, learning all he willingly gave up so that he could go to Calvary, and now learning about all that he does, that I may know him, we thank you for the privilege and the freedom to choose to set our own goals of knowing your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We can use our free will, and we thank you for that. We ask and pray these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and for his sake, amen.